So thank you all for your patience and uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you all here today for this webinar on the non-invasive optoacoustic imaging of proteinopathy in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. I'm Dr. Tim Devling, the Director of Sales and Applications at iThera Medical, and I'll be moderating this session. The webinar itself will last for about 40 minutes and we very much encourage questions. If you maximize the GoTo tool, you can see a question box where you can type them in and we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. The webinar itself will also be recorded for our YouTube channel and we'll send you a link in the next few days. So very much like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Ruqing Ni. She's group leader at the University of Zurich and Institute for Biomedical Engineering at ETH, also in Zurich. Uh, Ruqing performed her PhD in neurodegenerative diseases at the Nordberg lab at the Karolinska and has since developed this at Zurich with a strong interest in the in vivo high resolution imaging of Alzheimer's through a variety of imaging methods, including PET, MRI and MSOT with the InVision optoacoustic platform. So we very much look forward to an interesting talk and over to you, Ruqing. Um, thank you for the introduction and uh, for the opportunity to share our results. I will be talking about uh, the optoacoustic imaging for detecting protein aggregates in Alzheimer's amyloid models. Um, so I will focus on our recent study on imaging amyloid and tau in amyloid doses and tau C mouse models. Um, Alzheimer disease is the most common cause of dementia. Uh, it is about 15 million people worldwide living with Alzheimer's disease, and this number is projected to grow to 150 million in 2050. So Alzheimer's disease is a whole marker by two pathological uh, protein aggregates, amyloid beta plaque and the neurofibrillary tangle formed by herperphosphorylated tau, shown on the right side of the slide. Um, so um, animal models that such as transgenic knocking mouse model as well as rat model has been developed to recapitulate the amyloid and tau, or also the both of these protein pathologies. So um, the animal models has greatly facilitated the development of um, a therapeutic treatment as well as our understanding of the disease mechanism. So the amyloid and the beta Amyloid beta and, and also tau fibril, they spread as, uh, spread across the human brain following a specific pattern. So there are, has been a rapid development in the amyloid imaging tracer. So among these, three of them has been approved by the FDA and the EMA for clinical usage to facilitate the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and has been incorporated into the diagnostic criteria. Um, so as we see on this slide um, in the first row in Alzheimer's brain, um, it shows a higher uptake, uptake in the cortical region compared with the second row control cases. For the tau imaging, there has been two generations of tracers being developed. Uh, so so one of them, the uh, Tosipir, has been also approved uh, by the FDA. So using M1 and Tau imaging probe, it has greatly assisted the early and the differential diagnosis of other disease, as well as the other um, memory topsy, and uh, provide a window for early intervention. Uh, in preclinical imaging, multi-scale multimodal imaging tools has been developed, such as uh, PET and the uh, high-field MI, that give you a, a greater field of view, but uh, is relatively low in resolution. In addition to photo microscopy, it's a superior resolution, but is uh, limited by the field of view. So photoacoustic tomography is uh, a rather relatively new technique that provides a uh, Missile scale resolution and uh, able to cover the uh, whole mouse brain or animal brain at the same time. So in this study, we used um, 
uh, the MRI as well as the photoacoustic tomography show on the right side of the slide. So we are first going to the amyloid and beta imaging in animal models. Um, there are currently, um, again, in the preclinical imaging of amyloid deposits in mouse brain. So far, um, PET has been developed and uh, has provided uh, um, excellent sensitivity and uh, quantification capacity. However, it has a uh, rather limited uh, spatial resolution of around uh, 0.7 to 1.5 millimeter range. This is relatively um, suboptimal to the small mouse brain and uh, hindering the accurate mapping. In addition, uh, magnetic resonance imaging has been reported to develop a beta aggregate with or without using contrast agents. Um, however, the sensitivity is relatively uh, low compared with the PET. In addition, optical imaging modalities has been applied, such as uh, diffuse fluorescent imaging, which possess a uh, high detection sens sensitivity, but the resolution and the quantification capacity are uh, hampered by the intense light scattering in the deep brain region. Two photon imaging has also been used, however, uh, it has suffered from a sub millimeter penetration and a small field of view. Uh, and uh, as we know, event accumulation is occurred also in the um, hippocampus and uh, different region. So um, one of the great advantage of PET is to enable longitudinally monitoring the amyloid beta accumulation in the mouse brain. So uh, on these slides, we can see uh, the previous study using 18 more labeled of lobetamin to characterize the growth and the de development across different uh, string of animal models. So for the optoacoustic imaging, there has been several studies performed using contrast agents to study in Alzheimer's mouse, um, such as our previous study uh, using amyloid contrast agent and also tau imaging probe. There has been a uh, one, uh, one tracer developed for detecting microglia or inflammation in Alzheimer's mouse brain, as well as a triple, triple modality imaging probe called the CDA3, developed uh, several years ago. So in our study, we screen for a panel of uh, compounds and uh, identify two compounds used in our study. First, uh, we uh, look at the uh, curcumin der derivative Two. So this is a, a compound developed by Professor Ran uh, several years ago, and uh, our um, in vitro test shows that uh, it has uh, absorbance around uh, 60, 640 and uh, binds specifically to a beta fibrils. So, uh, so the results show on this slide shows that there's a linear signal increase with the uh, um, binding between quinet and the A-beta, and uh, it shows a very specific binding only to fibrillar form, but not to the monomer form, and it shows rather low non-specific binding to BSA, for example. So next we scan the ACT-A-beta ACT mouse, which is a transgenic model for other amyloid doses. And uh, we observed that uh, the signal is higher in the transgenic mouse compared to the non-transgenic mouse by using the um, inhibition system. High cortical signal can be observed. Um, one thing I want to mention is that uh, we are not able to uh, mix uh, um, the cranial specific channel in this study. And uh, uh, so for this purpose, we try to uh, see if we can acquire more in, uh, more frequent uh, frequencies and uh, um, develop a better uh, mixing method. And another thing I want to mention is about the registration. So previously, we have developed a semi-automatic tool to register um, between the MI and the optoacoustic image to enable better region of interest quantification. 
So uh, recently, there's also a deep learning based method built, which provides uh, automatic uh, um, resolution without uh, manual input. So uh, for the 3D imaging of the distribution, here we use uh, uh, the uh, VM sort developed by Professor Daniel Rolanski. So as shown on this slide, um, such imaging modality is able to detect the uh, calcium activity in mouse brain with um, around 130 micron resolution and give a uh, um, yeah, excellent result. So in our study, we characterized the resolution of uh, the device again and uh, found the resolution is about uh, 110 to 130 micron. Uh, and then we administered the granite probe into the mouse and uh, following multi-spectrum accreditation, we found that uh, the signal is um, um, increasing with time only in the 660 channel and uh, remains stable in the 800 nanometer channel and the 650 nanometer channel, which um, we are convinced it's uh, representing the increased uh, uptake by granite. Afterwards, uh, we quantify the signal by volume, um, volume of interest uh, analysis using PMOS, which is a standard software using in MicroPET study. Um, next, we perform a simultaneous epifluorescence uh, and uh, VM sort of imaging. So as shown on the left side, so the signal increase is uh, um, very specific and uh, very high at 20, 40 minutes and uh, uh, decrease over 120 minutes. So this is reflected also in the photoacoustic imaging. And uh, in addition, we can observe that uh, on the right side of the site, there are higher uptakes in the cortical region compared with the cerebellum. So um, next, we also investigate uh, another processing based uh, probe called the uh, AOI987. So this probe similarly has a quite um, um, high absorbance at around uh, 640. And as you see on the uh, left side of the image, so this is the, from the original study published uh, in 2005 using a uh, near infrared and uh, uh, which give you only the 2D information. So in our study, we tested the uh, both in APB PS1, it's another string of uh, amyloidosis mouse, as well as in Arctic A beta mouse. Um, after quantification, volume based uh, quantification, we can detect there are uh, increased uh, signal in cortical, hippocampal, and the uh, thalamus region in Arctic A beta, uh, and also APB PS1 mouse compared with the uh, control mouse. So, one thing we want to mention is that. Uh, the Arctic A beta mouse shows a rather high uptake in the thalamus compared with uh, the other two. Um, for the ex vivo validation, so we perform um, double staining using um, the probe granite as well as uh, antibodies specific for A beta, such as X6010, as well as the fibular form of A beta, such as antibody OC. And then we observe um, over quite good de detection of the probe to the to the um, amyloid beta. So in the final row, we can observe so the probe appear also to detect the cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Um, similar double staining has been performed using LI with the um, antibody 6010. Uh, we can observe the signal is detected mainly in the cortical region and uh, hippocampus. One interesting observation for the Arctic A beta mice is that there are also strong uptake in the or strong staining in the thalamus, which is uh, quite absent in the APP PS1 mice. So this actually um, validates our in vivo observation of quite high uh, uptake for the 
จะมาเดอัปเดตไปทำใหม่ so uh, next I want to discuss our recent finding on tall m o t a l imaging in animal model so similarly there is a gap in imaging and t a l at a high resolution in mouse model so pet um, pet uh, t a l imaging has been performed using PPP3 as well as uh, THK compound in previous studies, such as in P0 mouse model of photo repeats. Um, however, uh, the resolution is facing a similar problem as amyloid imaging. So, uh, near infrared imaging has also been possible using PPP5. Uh, this is also the compound we are going to uh, use in our study. So, photo imaging has also been Um, developed such as using the compound HS84 uh, and the enable high resolution monitoring of the growth of uh, tau. So, as the uh, tau aggregates mainly observed or start in the hippocampus, um, therefore, um, p h o t o g o s t imaging provides a unique uh, advantage for deep brain region detection of tau imaging. So in this study, we use a compound p p v 5 which is a derivative of p p v 3 and uh, uh, it's also similar as PM p p v 3 that's used in the clinical trial. So compared with p p v 3 it has a higher absorbance spectrum that's suitable for p h o t o g o s t i c imaging. In the fluorescence test, we can see p p v 5 shows basic binding to the complement o c a t i n g tau f i b r i l and it also detects. Uh, Um, well, to the tau aggregates in CVD and the uh, PSP patients. So, in the um, final column on the right side, we can observe that uh, there are quite good overlap between the PPV5 signal with the 88 um, staining for phosphorus and tau. So, similar to the Pipeline show previously. Here we use a similar one that uh, enables simultaneous detection of epifluorescence and the p h o t o g o s t i c signal. So the uh, so the device gives you a field of view of uh, 15 um, times 15 times 15 um, millimeter, and uh, with a resolution about 130 micron. So first we uh, performed a uh, After image acquisition, we perform a reconstruction and uh, a mixing and uh, for the uh, hemoglobin and uh, PPV5 channel, and uh, we converted short the data with uh, MRI. For so in this study, we perform a dose dependent um, escalation design, and uh, we found that uh, although um, fluorescence imaging require much lower Concentration of the probe injection, but uh, at uh, 25 milligram per kilogram weight of the mouse, uh, p h o t o c o s t imaging give a sufficient detection signal and uh, enable to separate uh, clearly from the hemoglobin or the endogenous signal. So this slide shows the. Um, A mixed p p v 5 channel image superimposed to the MI atlas, and uh, we can see that uh, there are increased uh, signal in the uh, cortex in the hippocampus of the p 0 l mouse compared with the white type mouse. It is also uh, the time code fits well with the frozen imaging on the right side of the slide. So um, the quantification. Show that uh, there are a higher uptake in the cortex hippocampus as well as in the s a l i v a s in the transgenic mice compared with white type, and uh, the absorbance uh, correlates uh, well with the fluorescence intensity. An um, XVO validation is performed by using um, p h o t o c o s t imaging as well as uh, fluorescence microscopy as well as uh, Multi-photon imaging. So uh, for the limitation, 
I want to mention that uh, we have not uh, performed the uh, pharmacokinetics um, in the above mentioned study. In addition, longitudinal imaging will be uh, essential to um, enable utility of this method. And uh, in addition, a um, second near infrared window probe will be um, great and uh, enable to um, enable better signal. So um, in the previous study, we so far has only performed a very short longitudinal study, including the 14 months uh, AP, APP mouse and uh, follow up to one month. However, we can observe there are a consistent uh, signal increase among the mice. Longer um, like a, a period of monitoring will be needed to validate uh, such method. So in summary, we demonstrate in vivo high resolution whole brain amyloid and tau imaging by uh, photoacoustics without the skull opening in an amyloid mouse as well as in four repeat tau mice. Such an uh, imaging platform offers new prospects for in vivo study into amyloid and tau related mechanisms. In addition, it will be potentially enable imaging other protein opsies such as alpha synuclein. So I want to thank um, um, my previous lab, um, professor headed by Professor Daniel Rudensky, and uh, the current lab by Professor Roger Nish and um, collaborator for these studies and the students uh, as well as funding. Thank you very much for listening and uh, please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you very much, Ruking. Really appreciate you giving the talk here. That was very, very interesting. Uh, as Ruking mentioned, you can ask questions in the text box, and I'll begin with the questions that have come in so far. And it's one regarding optoacoustics in general, and it is you have, thank you very much for the talk, you focused on molecular imaging, but is it also possible to, to do functional imaging with an MSOT device as you would do with MRI, like measure oxygenation? or DCE? Um, thank you very much. We actually have published another study in 2008 using uh, in vision photoacoustic imaging to detect uh, the uh, functional change in animal mouse. So uh, however, um, however, we did uh, like a, a oxygenation challenge and uh, did not find uh, too much change, but it will enable us to combine with the ASL measure of a cerebral blood flow to get a um, CMR2 value. So I think that's still quite useful. Okay. Um, a further question regarding the agents that you used. You particularly focused here on uh, those involved in Alzheimer's, but are there other similar agents available for other neurological disorders? Um, yes, thank you for the question. So uh, there are actually a lot of uh, agents existing and also for detecting the neuroinflammation as well as for uh, glioma. Uh, many of these compounds actually is a, has a, like a multimodal concept. So we previously has also using MNP uh, compounds to detect the, the, uh, the metal proteinase uh, yeah, in stroke mouse model. Okay, and a follow-up question relating to the agents is, does the blood-brain barrier permeability um, affect um, agent distribution to the, to the target? Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's very much so. But uh, for our compound, it's a small chemicals below 500 kilodalton, so it, it should be fine with the blood-brain barrier penetration. Okay, uh, further question. Um, would you consider OCT, optical coherence tomography, as an alternative way to image uh, these probes? Uh, I think that's very interesting technique, but uh, I have no experience with that. Sorry. Um, and does CRAMA2 label CAA in addition to parenchial plaques? Uh, exactly. So as uh, we show on the staining, it's uh, clearly labeled cerebral amyloid angioplasty. 
So there are um, probe like uh, people also spe specifically designed the probe to bind only to CAA as well. But I think most of the probe bind to uh, them simultaneously or both. Okay. Um, a further question is lovely 3D imaging. The, the, the I think this is more of a, a technical question. Um, the 3D cup that uh, was used here was developed by Daniel Rosansky uh, at Zurich. Um, it, the 3D imaging wasn't performed on the InVision system, the commercial system, but I would point out from Ithera, uh, a variant of that 3D cup is available that does work on that uh, system and that was developed from the design made by Professor Rosansky at Zurich. So the system that Rukwing was using is a combination of a commercial system and a homemade system, and the homemade component is available with the commercial system now. Uh, sorry, I'll jump into this one. Um, what was the center frequency of the transducer used in the study? Um, I think it's 100 hertz. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. another question more on the biology. Did you check for correlations between your probe and differentially aggregated beta, such as plequasaur oligomers? Uh, yeah, we didn't check uh, oligomers, so we found that it does not bind to mon uh, it does not bind to monomer very well. Um, but the oligomer is uh, difficult to um, kind of um, test in our system because the uh, status of oligomer I mean it's going to change. So, okay. but I think from the previous study, it shows that this probe binds to a fibular form. So, yeah, to only the aggregated form. Okay. Actually, an interesting question regarding um, the near, near infrared one versus near infrared true, uh, two is, are you photon limited at 660 nanometers for penetration into the brain? And uh, I think that obviously leads on to, to your comment about developing more near-infrared two probes, which would allow deeper penetration. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, the penetration depth is, uh, for our current study, is fine. And as we see, it can illuminate the whole brain. So the main advantage of near, a second near-infrared window is it gives you better signal-to-noise ratio, I think and a better uh, separation from the hemoglobin. So as our current probe is around uh, 660 or 640, it's quite close to the, I mean, hemoglobin. Yeah, so I suppose this is uh, it's another general question about probe design, but generally for optoacoustic imaging, you want a probe that absorbs reasonably high up in the infrared scale, around uh, 800 to 900 nanometers uh, and, um, molecules which absorb light very well, low quantum efficiencies, they tend to be good optoacoustic probes and also don't have similar characteristics to endogenous chromophores like uh, hemoglobin, they also work well. So, so that's kind of a general characteristic of those probes. Um, I think there's one final question, actually just a clarification. Uh, the skin and skull were intact in your models? Uh, yeah, so so for so, our uh, imaging, so um, because uh, the mouse we use is black six, so we have to shave the mouse. And uh, uh, but uh, otherwise, uh, I mean, if the mouse don't have a strong pigment in the skin, then there's no reason to open the scalp, and uh, the scalp does not uh, interfere with the signal acquisition or the signal um, quality. Yeah, I think this is, um, I mean, one of the features of optoacoustics or of MSOT is we use a low frequency um, signal. So we use a five megahertz signal for the ultrasound and that does penetrate well through uh, intact skin and skull. So it's another nice feature for neuroimaging. Um, so I think we've gone through the majority of the questions here. So uh, thanks a lot to the audience for listening and for, for sending along such a, a variety of questions. And a big special thank you to Rukwing uh, for taking the time today to present on her work and I look forward to seeing how this develops in the future. Thank you very much. Goodbye everybody. Bye bye.